Friends, why don't you take a seat and uh, Hannah's gonna bring us our teaching text today. Hello, church. If you don't know me yet, I'm Hannah. I'm one of the interns here. (laughs) Okay. So today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 31 to 34. Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 34. His mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, Look, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, Who are my mother and brothers? Looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks be to God. Well, if uh, we haven't met before, my name's Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. It's my privilege to bring you the word today. And uh, it's my privilege to do so on Mother's Day. It's a good day to talk about family, which is what I sense God putting on my heart when I was writing this message. Now, I don't know about you, but have, have you ever had a moment where you have been around your family and you think, my family just doesn't get me? Like, they just don't understand me in this moment. Yeah, I, I see that hand and I affirm it. I, 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 I'm an adopted only child, which means it is virtually impossible for me to do anything wrong, right? Like it, it, is, it is very, very difficult. There's a lot of like backdated guilt sitting there uh, for me to work with. I mean, even when I told my parents I was becoming a pastor, they were like, son, we respect your, your decision and we think the financial implications will be fine which might have been passive aggressive in hindsight. But the only time I can really remember them thinking I was actually crazy was when I told them I was moving to Japan for a year. And they started with gentle conversations like, oh, you've only just started your job. Are you sure this is a decision you wanna make to quit your job? And and then it kind of kept moving a little bit to like, honestly though, have have you ever done a load of washing? Just like once, one time. (laughs) I've seen you iron, do you have any other skills whatsoever, any. Like one is great, more would be better. And eventually they kind of just left it and settled into it with just don't be stupid enough to break up with that Jenny girl for the love of God. <laughs> so I got one of them right. But I, I know other people would have had moments in their life where you are making a decision and it baffles your family and you feel very, very convinced that you're making the right decision and everyone in your family is like, you know, if they're middle class are politely wringing their hands and saying nothing and if, and if they're not, are just going for the jugular. Either way, you know what it's like. Um, whether it's as big as, as a relationship or a decision to move overseas or as small as a bad haircut, Cooper, it could be anything. <laughs> to- <coughs> That's like stuck in my throat. The, um, it could be anything, could be anything, he loves it. There are moments of conflict and confusion within family dynamics where particularly as kids grow up, we begin to do unexpected things that freak out our family who think they know what we are about. Uh, my favorite example of this is like every three months when I give one of my children some kind of food that they've always loved and they're like, I hate that. Since when? Always. I've always hated it, like, really? Because I've, I've got, like, Instagram here that says four months ago, you, like, thumbs up as you're eating the same meal. Right, this happens to everyone. Jesus was no exception. And it's really important that we remember that just because he was the perfect son of God doesn't mean he had a perfect family or a family with no problems. But it's fair to say he started quite well. There were signs and prophecies that he would be special. There's the angel Gabriel predicting it to Mary, John the Baptist leaping in his mother's womb and shepherds and wise men miraculously turning up to follow him. Uh, The only prophecies I can remember over our children were a series of radiologists who kept saying, wow, these are some big babies that Jenny is carrying. (laughs) And they were. And Mary, Mary, this woman of faith chosen by God to carry and mother the saviour of the world and then deal with all the side-eyeing about her mysterious pregnancy. And you know that was there. She remembers the prophecies and the miracles, the reactions of others to this extraordinary child. She keeps them in her heart. She stores them. Luke 2.19 says that Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. So Mary not only stored these precious memories in her mind, she treasured them because they were ongoing proof that Jesus was who He said He was. And if I'm Mary, it's very helpful to me to have that ongoing proof that Jesus is who He said He was. So she reflects on God's promises to her and to all the world through her. And everything that we know through Scripture indicates that Mary was Jesus' biggest champion. 
which is what makes today's teaching text so uncomfortable. Because as we come to this passage, even though it's only Mark chapter three, we've got to remember that all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're these four different biographies that form different viewpoints for one big picture. And so Mark, we're only in Mark chapter three, but part of the other gospels have given us this great context for the background of Jesus' life. And so Mark's writing in a quick way so that we can read it and forget about that background really. But there's a lot that's gone on before then. For example, there was the per first public miracle that Jesus performed, the wedding at Cana in Galilee, where he turned water into wine, which by the way, if you're gonna start out with a public miracle, that's a cracker. That is a cracker, very popular. Great crowd please, of water into wine. And one of my favorite parts is how Mary was just there in the background, like really overmothering the situation. And so Jesus is just sort of hanging at the wedding quietly, you know, probably praying, discerning what the Father's saying. And Mary's like, um, Jesus, your cousin Nathaniel, he, um, did you know he's run out of wine? He's a bit ashamed of, um, like, this is embarrassing for him. And Jesus is like, okay. She's like, well, do you wanna like, <laughs> he's like, mom, like, you know, just, I know you can, you can do a prayer and just, do you wanna do something about that? And literally Jesus is like, woman, my time hasn't come, which is translated for mom. If I wasn't the son of God, I'd be saying, shut up. But I am, so I won't, but just stop it. And so she goes over to the servants and she's like, just you do whatever he tells you to. He's like, I'm right here, I can hear you. I can hear you, I'm gonna do it. Don't tell me what to do. And she's like, okay, watch this. It's gonna be really good. I've seen him do this one before. <laughs> just on a glass, but it'll be really good with the whole thing. <gasps> and the steward comes out. She's like, you've saved the best wine for last. And, Mary, and everyone's applauding, going, oh, where did this come from? And Mary's like, And Jesus, you just know he's standing there like, I'm not gonna die on the cross later for this. That's, you know what I mean? Like, that, this is not what I'm dying for. Full mum mode. Mary was no exception to embarrassing your child in public. But all jokes aside, Mary had not only heard of the miracles, she'd experienced the miracles. That's really important. She is right there witnessing this happen. And everything we see in the wedding suggests that she's not only experiencing it, she's expecting it. She's like, oh, Jesus will fix it up. No worries, you got this? You got this. And the context of Mark 3, though, is not one of experience of miracles or trust in prophecies, is it? It's one of disbelief, pure and simple. His mother and brothers and sisters have heard about the crowds who follow him, and these crowds seem to be split between either worshipping him or despising him, both of which could be slightly disturbing to a family member. So they come to the conclusion that they need to do what's best for Jesus. Now, this is a common issue for families, right? You gather, you have a little intervention, like I'm a bit worried about their job. I'm a bit worried about their relationship. All right, let's, let's do something about it. But in this case, this is not quite an ordinary family. You might want to think twice, especially if you're Mary, before you challenge what Jesus is doing. So her sons and her daughters, Jesus' little brothers and sisters, and spare a thought for what it was like growing up with Jesus as an older brother. They all come along to supply some backup muscle to the maternal guilt that Mary's carrying. And his disciples come to let him know. They say, your family's here, Jesus. What do you wanna do? And Jesus issues this astounding line where he says, oh, my mother and my brothers are here? Well, who are my mother and brothers? And I don't know if the disciples thought he was suffering from heat stroke or something. They're like, oh, that they're, you know, James and Jude. And like, no, 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 no. But it appears that Jesus is disowning his family. It appears that Jesus is having a conversation in which he says, I know who my mother and my brothers are, but they're not my true mother and my brothers, don't worry about it. And this is way more significant than even we might imagine. Now, if you do that to your family, it will not go well. I promise you that it will not go well. However, it was even worse back then. A lot of families still live together even after the kids got married. They all live together in the one big home. Often the family unit was also an economic unit. They had a small business together. We know that Joseph was a carpenter. The whole family might've been involved in that, which means that the eldest son bolts and rejects the family. That not just has social and relational implications, it has economic implications. There are a lot of things going on here. And Jesus seems to be making a serious break with the family. Could it be just as simple that they have crossed a line that cannot be crossed and challenging Jesus' mission. But Jesus isn't finished. He keeps going on. He looks at those sitting in a circle around him and he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother 
and sister and mother. And at this point, you could almost be forgiven for thinking Jesus has just lost the plot. It's been a big day, but he hasn't. So what is he saying here? I think one of the things that must have grieved Jesus' heart the, heart the most in this moment is the fact that Mary, who appears to be Jesus' biggest cheerleader, you know, that's what mums do. They're your biggest cheerleader, sometimes to the point of irrationality. Mama bear syndrome, it just comes out. Jesus has his biggest cheerleader here and she says, I don't understand what's going on or I do understand and you're wrong and appears to be wanting to drag him home or talk some sense into Jesus. But Jesus does what any of us can do if we really want to. He does not get fussed and he changes the conversation. He just says this, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And he starts a new conversation where he explains what God is renewing through all the world, but specifically through the family, through the household. Jesus sees the claim his family is trying to place over him in that moment. You're our family member, you're coming with us. And he rejects the claim and then reframes it. Instead of his family having a claim over him and being able to drag him home, he redefines the concept of family altogether. Jesus states that those who are with him now, calling him Lord, listening to his teaching, doing the will of God in their lives, they are his true family. And Jesus here begins a whole new idea of family. Jesus states that everyone's loyalties need to shift. Family is not our number one priority. God is our number one priority. The family of God is our number one priority. Now pause there for a second, because this is an earthquake of a statement, right? Like, and if you're here and you're wondering what kind of cult your family members have gotten into, if you're a guest, (laughs) I'll explain. The explanation, not the cult part. (laughs) I do not mean that your family should cut you off to focus on Encounter Church. That's not what we're talking about here. And I'll get to that in a minute. What I do mean, as N.T. Wright says, through Jesus' words, God is doing the unthinkable. He's starting a new family, a new holy people, and is doing so without regard for ordinary human family bonds. He's cutting through that. Earlier, as he taught on marriage, Jesus had confirmed what Jewish people already knew, that when they get married, a man and a woman, they leave their homes and they form a new household together. That's how it normally happens. We're familiar with this idea. This is how it happens in our part of the world normally too, right? As a general rule, you get married and you form a new household together. But here, Jesus expands on the idea of a new household and he reframes it. In this new household, it's not the husband who's the head of the house, it's Jesus. Jesus is the head of the home. The family is everybody who trusts in him for salvation throughout the whole world and through all human history. They are a family connected not by blood, but by God's merciful decision to adopt them as sons and daughters. They gather not around a dinner table, but a communion table. There are new values instituted by Jesus, new loyalties to Jesus as Lord and new siblings, your fellow church members. Jesus has created his new vision of family and he's issued an invitation to join him. And this is why when we do the baby dedication, I make the congregation respond because you have a responsibility. You are playing a part in accepting your role as the family of God for these babies. And you do that to everybody, right? I just get to make it a little more obvious during a baby dedication and help you to say some things to remind you that that's right, we are the village, we are responsible. But it isn't just responsibility, it's also a blessing. Being a part of a church, a local expression of God's family, means that it's now normal for relative strangers to make you a meal when you're having a hard time. It's now normal for people you don't know to pray for you and encourage you, maybe even in person. It's now normal for people you have never met to welcome you, to serve you and to bless you. That's what the local church is meant to look like. In God's new family, single people have caring partners around them, orphans have parents and families have, well, they're babysitters, don't they? In God's new family, the barriers of racial and economic division disappear because every believer is our sister and brother everyone in Christ. In God's new family, we pass around babies, we care around other people, care for other people's grandparents and we use our gifts and graces to bless the people of God. That's how we do it. But why do we do it? Why would Jesus tell us to put our energy here and not specifically in our biological family? Because in our biological family, we all understand that there is this inbuilt sense of obligation, right? Just Find out when you answer no next time mum invites you around to dinner. Like you'll get that inbuilt sense of obligation coming up. And there's nothing wrong with that. 
That was really what the tension was, I think, when Jesus was turning water into wine. That, you know, that sense that when mum asks you to clean your room, you just clean your room. It doesn't matter how old you are. The family is like a human pack bonded by blood. The church is not. The church is intended to be a vision of the kingdom of God itself. That is heaven. Church, when we do it right, gives us a glimpse into heaven. I've spoken about the blessing, but there's a cost to love people as well. In families, you might uh, cringe about Christmas dinner conversation, but the beauty of church is you get to have that every week. (laughs) In families, you might roll your eyes at having to help your brother move home, but in church, we roster you on as volunteers to voluntarily serve people that you don't even know. It's one of the great scams of all time. (laughs) It is formative It's a blessing and it's a responsibility. That's the vision of the kingdom of God, of God's new family. It comes at a cost and it's a heart to make strangers into family. You've all heard the saying, blood is thicker than water. Well, it's not in the church. Blood is not thicker than baptism water. We go through the waters of baptism. We're born again and we we become God's family together. It is a deliberate sacrificial attitude of love towards people that you might have nothing in common with except Jesus and that's, enough. But this vision is also why it can be so tense when you wrestle with your sense of obligation to your biological family and your spiritual one. Because a church community should not be so much a replacement for your biological family as a fulfilment of it. The church, this church and any other church you may be a part of is meant to act in the capacity of family for us in every way. Now, sadly, that is so often not our experience, right? Right? And we grieve that, but that's what it's meant to be. And I may have lost you at this point if you're currently not a believer in Jesus. This may just seem like a little much, just bear with me for a second, because this passage is not Jesus rejecting his family. It is just the ultimate redefinition. Here's what Jesus says. He teaches that we have an obligation to our earthly family, to the religious leaders. Later on in Mark chapter seven, he speaks to, they claim they were making offerings to God. And Jesus said, you're not making offerings to God. You're avoiding supporting your family. That is not the same thing. You can do both. And he calls them hypocrites and lawbreakers. He said that their statement reveals their character. In 1 Timothy 5, Paul writes to his disciple, Timothy, that if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he is worse than an unbeliever. He has denied his faith. That is, Paul is saying that caring for your biological family is part and parcel of being a part of God's new family. If you're in God's new family, the church, you must care for your biological family. It's an overflow. In the same vein, Paul in Ephesians 6 reminds children, as we heard before, to honour their parents and obey their parents. And in another part of that passage, which I like a lot less, encourages fathers not to stir up or aggravate or frustrate their children. The family unit is honoured in the Bible. But at the end of that Ephesians 6 passage, we're reminded of the actual goal with children. Bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Deep down, we parents, if you're in the room and you've parented a child, you know that your goal is not to grow your child into your best friend. That is not the vision. And your goal is not to protect them from every possible bump and bruise, but to raise them to be the best possible adult. Now, do we want those other things? Of course we do. But that's not the vision. The vision is the adult they're becoming. And so God's specific vision is that we as parents grow them up in training and instruction of the Lord to be faith-filled followers of Jesus as best as we can. It's out of our control, but as best as we can, we invest towards that, who know Him personally and live that out in ways that are unique to them. That's God's desire for us. And that is attention. It's attention, not just to people with and without beliefs. It's attention of honestly saying, God, you love my child more than I do. God, your vision for my child is better than mine. God, your desires for my child are better than mine. That is really hard to say. It is even harder to do because if your child comes home and says, I feel God is calling me to be a missionary in the Sudan, how do you then respond? Even if you're full of faith, like, oh, okay. Uh, Have you prayed about it? (laughs) Or if your child comes home and they say, I'm so glad for this medical degree. I think God wants me to work with orphans in Rwanda. We're like, I love that in principle. Have you thought about the financial implications? We we tend to, as we get older, get a bit more risk averse. And we try and put that aversion onto our children. 
who God is purposing and gracing in new pathways forward. And in the family of God, He's not just giving them ideas, He's giving them a calling. He's giving them a unique purpose for their lives in Christ, inspired and led by the Holy Spirit. So when our kids began to develop independence, this is the great revealer. And this is the tension Jesus brought into the light in this passage. The tension between loving and honouring your family, but not at the expense of loving and honouring God. Yet at the same time, loving and honouring God, catch this, in a way that causes you to love your biological family even more. That's the dream, that's the vision, and it's hard to live out. So here we are, it's Mary and all Jesus' siblings. Joseph, historians believe, has passed away at this point. So Mary is a single mum that's raised a brood of children fiercely under the worship of Yahweh. We know Mary loves God, yet here she is trying to stand in the way of the Son of God and His purposes. So what do we do? What must she have felt in that moment? A rejection, fear, grief, a mix of all of it probably. Has my son, the son I treasured in my heart, has he rejected me? But Jesus is love in human form. He's never forgotten his mother and he's never rejected his family. And in John's gospel, we see the absolute worst case scenario play out. Mother Mary has let son Jesus play out his life the way that he thinks is best. And where has it led him? Death on a cross. The ultimate worst case scenario for a mother killed by the Roman authorities and she stands at the foot of the cross grieving. She must wonder, what could I have done to change this? It's all very well for us thousands of years later to celebrate. Mary must wonder, what could I have done? But Jesus sees her in that moment and he sees the beloved disciple John and he calls out to them. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son, meaning John. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. And, and this friends is where all of this comes together. That by creating the new family of God, Jesus provides for his own family. That by creating the new family of God, Jesus says, John, you need to be a son to my mother. She has sons. You have unique gifts and graces that she needs right now. You will be a comfort to her in her grief. Mary, John needs you. As far as we know, he has his own mother, but he needs your unique gifts and graces in his life. I'm bringing you together as a mother and son within the family of God. Jesus had never forgotten her. He was just fully focused on living out God's vision for his life. And thank God for that. And later in the Bible, this is what we read. Jesus' brother James becomes the head of the church in Jerusalem. His brother Jude writes a letter that we have in the Scriptures now. They call their brother Jesus the Son of God. Jude calls Him Master, my Master. This is the same Jesus they grew up with, the same Jesus that they thought was insane in Mark chapter 3. How things have changed. How the new family of God has transformed their understanding of their own family. And in Acts we read that when the disciples gather in prayer after Jesus ascends into heaven, they do so with Mary and His brothers and sisters. Praise God. Church, sometimes this is how it works out. The family who don't understand your decisions at all are still your family to serve. The church that contains people that are very unlike you are still the new family of God to love and have fellowship with. And sometimes in God's grace and timing and through the passion of your prayer, appealing to God, not only does our church become our family, but our family becomes our church. Praise God. 